Welcome to the West Block Politics, People and Players. It's been over four months since two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, were detained in China following the arrest of Huawei's chief financial officer here in Canada last December. Since then, relations between Canada and China have been strained. But is Canada doing enough to push back against China? Australian professor Clive Hamilton released Silent Invasion, a book last year that looked at China's influence over Australia. He's been touring Canada and the United States this month, researching the influence that China has on this side of the Pacific. Welcome to the show, Mr. Hamilton. Good to be here. So you're here in North America taking a look at that Chinese influence. How significant do you think the influence and penetration is here in particular in Canada? I think it's very extensive and indeed very deep. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has been uh, developing its uh, influence in the major Canadian institutions over some decades now, going back to the 70s, in fact. And uh, what I think we've seen uh, recently is the first real test of the ability of the Chinese Communist Party to pull levers uh, in Canada. And it's been working pretty well. They've been working very hard at uh, continuing to penetrate uh, the Canadian institutions to influ influence the, the elites in business, in government, uh, in the universities. So um, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has a lot of powerful friends in Canada. When you look at where those powerful friends are, what would be some examples of some of those institutions where there's been significant penetration? Well, certainly in the business community, uh, if you look at the top companies, some of the most influential uh, and politically important uh, companies in Canada, they have long and deep uh, financial relationships with, uh, can, uh, with Chinese companies, and uh, they essentially see the world the way Beijing wants them to see the world. And they exert very considerable influence over both of the major political parties uh, in Canada, and uh, they uh, exert a tremendous amount of influence in shaping the way the federal government uh, responds to uh, China's demands. But it's not just at the federal government. Now, one of the things that has struck me, which is quite similar to what has been happening in Australia, is the way in which uh, the Chinese Communist Party and its um, agents of influence in Canada have uh, been impressing the uh, views of Beijing and advancing people sympathetic to them in local and state government as well. And so what we can see now is that there are substantial numbers of uh, people who uh, essentially operate on behalf of Beijing, occupying significant uh, political positions at all levels of government in Canada. Do you think that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government have been significantly influenced by the Chinese? I think there's no doubt about that. One can track the influence of uh, uh, Beijing, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, on the Liberal Party, through its major corporate donors, through some of its members, uh, through the entry of certain Chinese Can Canadians, those who are sympathetic uh, to Beijing, into politics, into the Liberal Party. And, I, and bear in mind that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's father was really um, yeah, a pioneer in opening up uh, relationships between Canada and China, and so Justin himself grew up in a Beijing-friendly atmosphere and has gained a great deal of support from, uh, from Beijing, from uh, uh, Chinese corporations, from major donors uh, who are linked to the Chinese Communist Party. And so I think the kind of mass eruption in the relationship that's happened over the last several months has come as a kind of uh, earthquake in, uh, to the thinking of the senior levels of the Liberal Party about how they deal with um, uh, this uh, country, which they thought was uh, their friend, suddenly turns into a bully, and uh, they don't really know how to respond to that. Well, and what do you make of the Canadian government's response so far? Because they've been demanding the release of the Canadians, but they haven't really taken any punitive measures against China in retaliation. 
Well, you know, I think the, uh, the government in Ottawa has really been quite weak in its response to Beijing. I think it's, uh, it's thinking about China and how to respond to this situation has actually been shaped uh, by people who are sympathetic to Be Beijing. And, of course, it's done, you know, the minimum necessary, which is demand the release of the two hostages, the, the, the two Michaels, who have been kept in terrible conditions and, and interrogated six or seven hours a day for no reason at all. Um, I think, uh, really, uh, Ottawa needs to be doing and could be doing a great deal more. I mean, the truth is that if you don't stand up to bullies, the bullies will keep doing it. And so uh, I think uh, a line in the sand needs to be drawn and that Canada needs to say to Beijing, we know you won't like this, but we are going to stand up for Canada's uh, interests and uh, we're willing to take the pain if that's necessary. If that means getting a, a bloody nose in order to stand up to Beijing, then so be it. What more do you think the Canadian government should be doing and what lessons can we learn from Australia? Well, I think Canada is really, you know, at stage one of the pushback process, and there are many stages to go, and Canadians need to decide whether they're going to push back against this extraordinary campaign of uh, China's influence uh, in Canada. Some people actually think it's too late that uh, China, the CCP, is so deeply embedded in Canadian institutions that it's too late. But uh, at a minimum, uh, Canadians, I think, have to try. Otherwise, you'll lose your sovereignty. You'll see continued erosion of uh, democratic rights. In Australia, we've undergone this uh, major national debate over the last two years, resulting in the federal government, on a bipartisan basis, passing some very powerful new legislation against foreign interference, clearly uh, directed uh, at uh, China, and essentially uh, turning into criminal offences a whole range of interference and influence operations which are covert, uh, uh, coercive or corrupt, uh, and which uh, really raise the stakes for Beijing in carrying out its influence operations uh, in Australia. And I truly think that uh, Canada needs to begin to take similar measures if it wants to protect its sovereignty. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Hamilton. A pleasure.